Welcome to Mountain View. My name is Haley Wolford, and I'm the Family Ministry Resident, and we are so glad that you're worshiping with us. If you're new to Mountain View, you can fill out our connection card at mtnvw.org connect, and we'll get in touch with you. We would love for you to chat with us during the service, and if you need prayer, please send us a private message. We encourage you to follow us on social media in order to connect with us during the week. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. And if you would like to give to the Ministry of Mountain View, you can do so at mtnvw.org slash give. Now, let's worship together. Hey, welcome to Mountain View. My name is Zach, and we're so glad you're here with us. Um, even in this season, there's a lot to be grateful for, so sing along if you know it.
you are here, you're working in this place, I worship you, I worship you, cause you are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you Yes, you are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are here. You're touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. Healing every heart I worship you, Lord I worship you Let's turn your life, you are here, Lord You're turning lives around I worship you Yes, I worship you Even when we don't see it, we sing it out, yeah. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop. Church, proclaim it out as we sing it. Yeah. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. He never stops, he never stops. Yeah. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I your work yeah. you never stop, you never stop working, yeah. you never stop, cause you're the way maker, way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, 
the light in your darkness my god that is who you are i'm unashamed to sing it out to him way make a miracle work promise keep light in the darkness my god that is who you are What a wonderful time of worship. Thank you, worship team, for leading us today. It always brings joy to my heart to be able to sing together. Now, this is a time in our service when we collect our tithes and offerings. We want to thank you for your continual generosity to Mountain View during this time. There are three ways to give. You can give online at mtnvw.org give. You can mail us a check at 40 East Highlands Ranch Parkway, or you can text to give at the number below. Let me pray for our tithes and offerings. Lord, we thank you for the blessings that you've given us during this time and that you were always here for us. I thank you that we are still able to give to the ministry of Mountain View and to impact our community and be the church to all those around us. I thank you for every individual who has given and continues to give, and I just pray that you be with us this day moving forward. Amen. Hello, and thank you for joining us today. I hope that you had a really great Memorial Day. Not sure what your Memorial Day might have looked like. Most likely, it looked a, li- looked a little different than how it's looked like in the past. If you are new to Mountain View, perhaps worshiping with us for the first time, we'd love to get connected with you. There's a really simple way to do that. Just simply go to mtnvw.org connect, and you'll find a form to fill out to start a conversation so that we can get better connected. There are many people in our culture who are both very curious and very confused about what happens after we die. Unfortunately, there's also many Christians who are just as curious and just as confused about these same issues. We're starting today a five-part series that's going to explore the Christian perspective on what happens after we die. What is the afterlife like? What will you look like in heaven? Will we know each other in heaven? Is Jesus really coming back soon? I believe by the time we get to the end of this series that you'll have more hope and more encouragement, not just about what is to come, but how to live your life now. Perhaps you've seen the show The Good Place with Kristen Bell and Ted Danson. It's a show about a lady who dies and then accidentally ends up in The Good Place. In fact, she ends up there by mistake. And the rest of the first season is about her trying to become a better person. She ends up there by mistake, and it's a belief that many people, I believe, in our culture have about heaven. And it goes like this. If you're good enough, you get in. That there's a good place, and getting to the good place means being good enough. And if you're good enough, you get in. But if you're not good enough, or someone else isn't good enough, then they don't get in. Is there really a good place? Is heaven the good place, where good people go after they die. Perhaps the better question is to ask, what does the Bible teach about heaven? And so the main thing that we're going to look at today is simply this, that our acceptance into heaven is based on the righteousness of Jesus, not our own performance. If you were to pick a New Testament writer or a New Testament character, whose life best exemplifies this change and this transformation. It has to be the Apostle Paul. If you were to go back and study the pre-Christian Apostle Paul, when we're first introduced to him in the book of Acts by his Jewish name, Saul, he grew up with the belief that his acceptance and his approval with God was based on his performance. How well he did as a Jewish person, how well he did keeping the law that whether or not God liked him or loved him, depended on his performance. And then something happened. And what happened was that Paul didn't just have a change of mind. Paul had a change of heart. When he encountered the risen Christ on the road to Damascus, and the love of God began to grip his heart, the Holy Spirit began to change his thinking. And the Apostle Paul went from a person who believed that he had to earn God's acceptance into one of the greatest preachers and teachers about the grace of God. 
One of the best examples that we have in the New Testament is the letter to the Roman church. In fact, all throughout the book of Romans, Paul talks about the graciousness of God. One of the best examples of that is found in Romans chapter 3, where Paul will talk about our acceptance. It's not based on our faultless law-keeping, but on trusting in what Jesus has done. Romans chapter 3, verse 21. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Paul says there's a right standing with God. There's a righteousness from God that is given to people apart from the law. The law that Paul is referring to is not uh, not our modern day law. It's not the law of speed limits. It's the Old Testament law or the Old Covenant law. It's the law of Moses, whose six or seven hundred different commandments covered everything from, from morality to mildew to civil matters. It covered almost every aspect of life. And it's this law that Paul is talking about that for over 1,000 years had served as the check engine light for the state of Israel, for the nation of Israel, for the Jewish people. It's like that check engine light on your dashboard. It's there to come on when your car has a problem. And the law of Moses was really good about serving as a check engine light. It would show up to, to show that the Israelites had a problem, where they were out of alignment, out of the will of God. In fact, the law of Moses was much like a check engine light in that it could diagnose the problem. It could tell you where you were going wrong, you know, where you had missed the mark. But there is one thing that the law of Moses could not do. The law of Moses, for all of its ability to point out the problem, the law of Moses can never solve the problem. And what is that problem? The problem is really the problem of the human race. It's a human problem. It's not unique to, to Jewish people or to Hebrews. It's our human problem of being unable to live a 100% perfect life. It's our inability to be holy, not just one time, but all the time. And so Paul says this righteousness of Jesus is given to us on the basis of our faith when we trust in what Jesus has done, not on our performance, which is a good thing. Because what Paul writes next are these words. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Paul goes right at this idea that many of us believe. And it's this idea that some people are better than other people. And Paul debunks this way of thinking. He says there's no difference, not between just one Jew and another Jew. There's no difference between a Jew and a Gentile. There's no difference between young and old. There's no difference between male or female, black or white. Paul says there's no difference between people. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That just simply means that I'm not any better than you are. It also means I'm not as good as I think I am. That when we recognize that everybody, every person has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, it levels the playing field. I'd like for you to think of it this way. Let's take two professional athletes who at one time in their career at the top of their game, and let's take these two athletes, let's let one be Usain Bolt, one time fastest man in the world, Olympic winner, you know, holder of the 100-meter record, and let's take John Daly, professional golfer, wins the PGA Championship, he wins the U.S. Championship, the you know, U.S. Open, and let's take these two top-class world athletes, and let's take them to Southern Colorado. Let's just drive a few hours from here, and let's go to a place that maybe you've already visited, the Royal Gorge, 
where you can walk across the suspension bridge and there's the, the, the swing that goes out over the gorge and that incredible drop-off. And from one side of the Royal Gorge to the other is 300 feet. And let's take Usain Bolt and John Daly and let's line them up side by side and let's make their task really simple. Let's see which one of you can successfully jump across the Royal Gorge. Usain Bolt, world's fastest man. You know, he looks like he's really fast. He can jump a far distance. And then you have John Daly, who I'm sorry, he's, he's a professional golfer. And these two guys line up side by side, and they take off, and they run. Which one do you think has the best chance of clearing the 300 feet? There's no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Neither Usain Bolt or John Daly would be able to clear the 300 feet. No matter how much training they put in, you cannot train to make the impossible possible. By sheer effort, you might make yourself incrementally a little better person. You might be kinder. You might learn how to be nicer. Maybe you can even learn how to hold doors for people and say thank you. And you can incrementally, by just sheer effort, make yourself a better person. But according to the Apostle Paul, there's no amount of willpower There's no amount of sheer effort. There's no amount of training that you could possibly do that would allow you to be 100% perfect all the time. Paul says everyone has sinned and everyone falls short, not just of clearing the royal gorge, but everyone falls short of the glory of God. The good news, according to Paul, is that this is what Jesus accomplished on the cross. Notice Romans chapter 3, verse 25. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time, so as to be just in the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Paul describes the kind of faith that saves. The kind of faith that saves is trusting faith in Jesus. And you might add, in Jesus alone. Paul says the the faith that saves is not a faith in my goodness or my ability to be good or even to be better. Paul says the faith that saves is not faith in Jesus plus, plus the ability to keep the law and to keep the Old Testament law faultlessly. It's not faith in Jesus plus your church attendance. It's not having faith in Jesus plus reading your Bible every day. What Paul describes is what many theologians call the all-sufficiency of Christ, that we don't need Jesus and anything else, that what we need, according to Paul, is Jesus alone, faith in Jesus, that God justifies those who trust in his Son. He goes on to deal with, with, with what is a natural tendency. And it's our tendency, perhaps, to inflate ourselves. And so Paul says in verse 27, Where then is boasting? It is excluded. Because of what law? The law that requires works? In other words, the Old Testament law, the pull-yourself-up-by-your-bootstrap way of thinking? The way of thinking that says God loves me because I'm lovable enough? Is that the law that we should boast? No, he says that law is excluded. Is it the law that requires works? No, because of the law that requires faith. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews alone? Is he not the God of Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too, since there is only one God. 
That's actually an echo. If, if you listen really closely, you'll hear echoes of the book of Deuteronomy. Where in the book of Deuteronomy, there's this famous exclamation. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Paul is just simply saying there's only one God. There's not a separate God for the God of the Jews and another God to be God of the Gentiles. There's only one God. And this one God, he will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through that same faith. Do we then nullify the law by this faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold, or most translations might say establish, the law. In other words, we bring through our faith and our faithfulness the law to completion. And Paul says our justification by faith, it establishes the law by fulfilling what the law always demanded, which was perfection. But what the people trying to keep the law could never attain, which was perfection. And who does that? Jesus. Paul says our justification by faith, it establishes what the law always required, but what people could never attain. If you were to look at the pre-Christian Paul, the pre-Christian Paul that we're introduced to in the book of Acts by the name of Saul, he took a lot of pride, a lot of boasting in his credentials. In fact, he'll write to the Philippian church and he'll, he'll say things like, if there's anybody who thinks they can have more confidence in their performance, he uses the word flesh. He says, I have more. He says, I was circumcised on the eighth day. I was a Hebrew of Hebrew, a Pharisee of Pharisees. He says, when it came to keeping the law, I was faultless. But then something changed in Paul. And what changed in Paul was that Paul met Jesus. And the moment that Paul met Jesus and he understood the gospel, Paul also understood he had, he had no grounds for boasting. Because all of that was taken away. It wasn't that, that, that Paul was slightly better than someone else or even a lot better than someone else. Paul says when you understand the gospel, that we're all the same. And there's no place for boasting. What is it that causes boasting? Honestly, it's our, it's our pride. It's our pride that, that says, you know, there's, there's really something in me that God found, you know, there, there's this God in me. God saw what? It's this idea that I did something. I had some, some merit. There was something I contributed. And it's what C.S. Lewis calls the great sin. That when we buy into this way of thinking and allow our pride to take control, it becomes this great sin. It's hard to believe that it's been almost, or actually over, 30 years. On March the 28th, 1990, Michael Jordan, who played for Chicago Bulls, maybe you've seen the wonderful documentary that's out. He scored 69 points that night, March 28th, 1990, against the Cleveland Cavaliers. Then rookie Stacey King, he made one free throw throughout the entire game. That night in the locker room, reporters are gathering around. They're talking to Michael Jordan. They're interviewing his teammates, and they talk with Stacey King. And Stacey King says to the reporters, I will always remember this night as the night that Michael Jordan and I combined to score 70 points. Now, obviously, Stacey King, he's joking. Unfortunately, many Christians are not. Many Christians, whether we verbalize it or we stay silent, we're often guilty of thinking. God and me, we combine to do a great thing. God chose me because why wouldn't he choose me? And it's that pride, it's that boasting, that Paul says there's no room for boasting. When you really begin to understand the gospel according to Paul, what you learn is that to be justified by our faith in Christ, it does require us to do something. It requires us to trust. It requires us to place our trust and our firm belief 
in what Jesus did for us on the cross. In the words of the old hymn, Rock of Ages, Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. That when we come to faith in Christ, we don't bring him our good works. We don't bring him a, a resume our LinkedIn profile. We, we don't list off all of our achievements. There's nothing in our hand that we bring. Simply to his cross, we cling. Paul says to be justified by faith. That's the gospel. The gospel is when God does for us what we could not do for ourselves. And that our justification is not some reward for being good enough. It's the grace of God. I know there may be some of you who've never responded to the call of the gospel. The call of the gospel is simply a call to turn away from your self-righteousness and to turn away from our self-reliance that believes that we can still fix it, we can still do it, we can still climb that ladder. It's to turn away from our self-righteousness and our self-reliance and to place our trust in the work of Jesus on the cross. And perhaps there's some of you who are watching, who you've been living your life to this point, believing the myth that you have to be good enough, or perhaps the other myth that you are good enough. The gospel says you can never be good enough. And if it hurts your feelings to hear that you're not good enough, that's good news. Because it takes the pressure, it lifts the burden off of your shoulders to always make the right choice, to always make the right decision, to do the right thing, to be 100% perfect. And to allow Jesus, the only person who is ever perfect, to be perfect for you. And when you place your faith and your trust in Christ, what we receive is the righteousness of Jesus. That when we are clothed with Christ, that when God looks at you as a person who believes in Christ, he sees his son. Your sins are forgiven. They're removed as far as east is from west. And you have the righteousness of Jesus. So I'd like to close in prayer. And give you this opportunity, if you've never before placed your faith and trust in Christ, to do so right now. It simply starts this way. God, I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. That I'm like just everyone else. And maybe everyone else, maybe other people in my life, they haven't acknowledged that. They haven't recognized that. But I, God, believe there's no difference in any of us. That I'm just like everyone else. I'm a sinner. And my sinner has separated me from you. And that you, God, took the initiative in sending Jesus so that I might once again, through my faith in you, be restored to relationship with you. And so, God, today I'm placing my faith where it belongs, in the work of Jesus. And I'm surrendering. I'm giving Jesus my life to be not just my Savior, but my Lord. And, God, I believe that you have the power to forgive the power to change, transform, and I'm accepting that gift right now. If you just made that decision, you've made the best decision ever. And there's something I'd like for you to do. I'd like you to text the phrase, yes to Jesus, to the number that's listed below. And if you're ready to be baptized, take that next step of faith, text that as well. And we have a series of follow-up texts to help you get started on your journey of following Jesus. Is there a good place? There is a good place. It's called heaven. Is it a place for those who've been good enough? No. It's for those who have placed their faith and trust in the only one who's ever been good enough, and that's Jesus. Thank you for joining us. Look forward to being back with you again. This is the part in our service where we come to communion. So go ahead and prepare your emblems, whatever they may be. Communion is a sacrament. 
and a sacrament is something that happens that we can't explain, but God can. With communion being a sacrament, it comes this question to mind, how do we remember something that we were never a part of, something that we weren't there for? When Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me, the word he used for remember was amnunesis, which means to remember again. A sacrament is a form of worship, and worship can remember the past and anticipate the future. And we can see this in Deuteronomy 6, 20 through 25. And it says, when your son asks you in time to come, what is the meaning of the testimonies and the statutes and the rules that our Lord our God has commanded you? Then you shall say to your son, we were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And the Lord showed us signs and wonders, great and grievous, against Egypt and against Pharaoh and against all of his household before our eyes. And he brought us out from there that he might bring us in and give us the land that he swore to give to our fathers. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God and for good always, that he might preserve us alive as we are in this day. So the word remember can be split up into re and member. We can't remember something that we weren't there for, but with it being a sacrament, it's something that only God can do. He's the only one that can bring both the body and the blood of Christ. And then we get to be the members. So as we take our bread and our cup, we get to know that because God called us into this community where he remembers for us, that we get to be part of an eternal moment. So go ahead and take your bread and take your cup whenever you're ready. And let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you and come before you as we get to be part of this eternal moment, God. We thank you for allowing us to be members of this body of Christ, Lord. We thank you for the power to do things that we can never do. And thank you for letting us always be part of this eternal moment and be in communion with you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. All creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing, Alleluia, Alleluia. O burning sun with golden beam, O silver moon with softer gleam, Kindness, you have poured out grace. You 
brought me out of darkness you have filled me with peace you're the giver of mercy you're my help in time of need lord i can't help but sing sing faithful you but we sing them up, up to him as praise and glory of what he deserves. And that all his promises are truly yes, and that's why we say amen. Amen? Yeah. And this is what we rest with, and that's why we sing. That I will rest in your promises. My confidence is your faithfulness. And I will rest in your promises. My confidence is your faithful. Church, come on, declare it. I will rest in your promises. My confidence is your faithfulness. And I
Thanks again for watching. You can find us right here at the same time each week. To stay connected with us throughout the week, follow us at Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube. And if you liked our service today, we encourage you to share this video. Thank you again for joining us. Have a great week.